Who would believe it? It's Parshas Re'e. It's been an entire year since the amazing Parsha Podcast Street has begun, and we are here together, all of us, the extended Parsha Podcast family, for a brand new edition of the Parsha Podcast for Parsha Ray of this year. It's been a whole year. We're starting year two of the street. Let us begin. Now, I must tell you, last week in the Parsha Podcast that concluded an entire year of the Parsha Podcast, I made the awful decision of trying to record a podcast during the day when all my kids were up and there was chaos and mayhem in the house. And I snuck off to one of the side rooms and I brought my trusty microphone with me and I had my notes on my iPad and I started recording. The kids were outside and things were going really swimmingly for about 20 minutes or so. And I'm recording... And there's a great vibe, and there's a great momentum, and things are amazing. And there's a little bit of noise, but it's okay. Nothing that you cannot fix in post. And then the floodgates of noise began. And there was pandemonium, and there was so much noise, I just had to stop the recording. So I said, you know what? I'm going to wait until the noise ends. Once the noise quiets down, I'll go back to my microphone and continue where we left off. And then I'll take all that empty space in the middle and I'll edit it out in post. And the friends and family members and audience of the Parsha podcast will never know the difference. Amazing. That was the plan. And in the end, I managed to sequester all the noisy kids in one room of the small cottage that we are staying in now in Canada. And I went to a different room on the other side of the house. And I said, okay, I'll just carry over my stuff and continue the recording there. What do you know? (laughs) What do you know? The carefully laid plans were torpedoed. I lifted my microphone. I took my iPad. I took my recording device. I took my boots that I had with me. I started to walk from one end of the cottage to the other. And by golly, what happened? It slipped out of my hands and it fell on the floor. And the batteries were expelled out of the machine. And the recording stopped. And my heart sank. And I quickly took the SD card and put it in the computer And I'm like, oh man, what's going to be now? Those 20 to 30 minutes of amazing recording. What happened to it? Because the microphone was still running. And I hadn't stopped the recording. I stick in the SD card to the computer. And the file shows up as empty. So we're back to square one. Those 20 minutes were never heard again. I had to record the whole podcast again. And then I remembered a idea that I heard from my grandfather of blessed memory. My grandfather said that to complete any task, to finish it, that is when it gets very difficult. And then I thought, hey, we're going to finish a whole year. The streak of a whole year, it's bound to have some problems. Something is going to go wrong. And thank God with the help of the Almighty, we re-recorded it again. And y'all didn't even know the difference. It sounded pretty good, I hope. Who knows? It was probably way better the first round. It doesn't matter now. We are in year two of the street. Please, God, with the help of the Almighty, this recording will not get erased. Please, 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 please. But I actually learned my lesson. It's now almost one in the morning. The cottage is silent. All the kids are sleeping, I hope. And it's just us. It's you and me and the Parsha podcast and we're Parsha's Re'e and we're nearing the end of another cycle of the Parsha podcast. And of course, I'm thinking about what we're going to do in the next cycle, how we're going to tinker with the format. And I really want to celebrate together with y'all. I really want to do something stunning to celebrate together at the end of the current cycle of the Torah. Before we jump back to the beginning or go back, advance to the beginning of Genesis once more. If you have any good ideas of how to celebrate, please send me an email, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. 
Okay, now let's get to the podcast. I saw a delightful little piece in the Arachayim, in this is Parsha, one of the commentaries in the Torah. And to me, it was a stunning piece, an eye-opening idea, something that dovetails with a lot of the ideas that we've discussed in the past. And I also think it's going to give us a very interesting and surprising call to action. So let's take a look at this amazing Arachayim. So our Parsha begins, Parsha's Re'eh, Moshe tells the Jewish people, we're still in the middle of Moshe's great speech, Re'eh anochi no se'en lefarachem ayom, behold, see, witness, visualize that I am placing before you today, bracha uklala, blessing and curse. That's the first verse of our Parsha. Moshe is going to place before us, look, I'm going to place before you, says Moshe, blessing and curse. The blessing, when you listen to the mitzvahs, of Hashem, your God, that I am commanding you today. Moshe not only tells us there's blessing and curse, he defines what blessing is. And curse, the third verse of our parsha, and curse if you do not hearken to the midst of Hashem, your God, and you deviate from the path that I'm trying to today to follow other gods, to do idolatry, to follow gods that you do not know. And of course, Moshe proceeds to talk about the blessings and the curses to be administered on Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel on the first day of the nation's crossing of the Jordan, something we read about in the book of Joshua. But I want to focus on the introduction. Moshe tells the Jewish people, Re'eh anochi no sein lefrechem ayom, Behold, see, I have placed before you blessing and curse. So first of all, I think Moshe is giving us a master class of communication. He's trying to give a very powerful message to the nation, and he does it by creating a sharp contrast, blessing and curse. When you know that that's the binary choice, that's much more persuasive than saying, hey, here's a blessing. Do you want it? Come take it. Moshe lays out the options. You have two choices and two choices only. There is blessing And there's curse, there's life and death, there's Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel, and you can only choose one. You know, we all like to keep our options open. We want to maintain optionality. We want to delay a choice until the very last moment. We want to keep our options open. We want to try to play both sides of the issue as long as possible. And Moshe says, no, there's two options. Look, look what I'm presenting before you. There's blessing and curse. And this is a style that Moshe uses again in a much starker fashion in chapter 30. Re'eh nasati l'fanecha yom. Again, he uses the same term. Re'eh see, I've placed before you. Es ha'chayim ve'es ha'tov. Life and good. Ve'es ha'mavis ve'es ha'ra. And death and bad. As an aside, I think that whenever we talk about the veracity and divinity of the Torah, I think the best way to structure the discussion is the same way Moshe does. That the Talmud says that if you believe that the Torah is of human authorship, and even if you say it's written by Moshe, and even if you say there's one word or one sentence that's authored by Moshe, not by God, you're cut off from the Jewish people. You lose your portion in the afterlife. You are someone who repudiates the divinity of the Torah. I think in the question of the divinity of the Torah, we have to again say, what are the choices? It's either this or it's that. It's either the Torah is divine or it's not divine. All of us are more comfortable perhaps using fuzzy terms. I like to call them verbal gymnastics. Oh, the Torah is divinely inspired. Have you heard that one before? It's divinely inspired. Basically, you're trying to take both sides of the issue. It's divine, but it's inspired. It's written by God, but it's written by man. The Talmud would tell you, no, there's only two choices here. It's either written by God, every single word, every single letter, and that's the Jewish belief. Or if you say it's written by a human, even if that human is Moshe, you are included in the people who repudiate the divinity of the Torah and lose their portion in the afterlife. Contrast. And Moshe is creating contrast for us as well. 
this is the best way to absorb messages. And what's the contrast? There's blessing and curse. There's good and bad. And the definition of blessing, Moshe tells us, is when you listen to the mitzvah of Hashem, you're God. And the definition of curse is when you repudiate the mitzvahs of God, when you reject and neglect the Torah, and you deviate from the path. And of course, this is the arch theme of the whole book. The whole book of Deuteronomy is Moshe preparing the nation. You're about to enter the land. There's all kinds of temptations for you there. You're going to forget all the things that you witness. You're going to be tempted and seduced by the Canaanites. And Moshe is trying to coach them and urge them and encourage them and threaten them and scare them to maintain the Torah. Moshe is preparing the nation for the challenges ahead. And that's the backdrop for this little delightful Arachayim that I am so excited to share with you on this Parsha podcast. And the Arachayim asks a few basic questions. He says, wait a minute. Moshe is saying words to the nation. Words. Words you hear and you do not see. Words connect to your ears, not your eyes. The word re'e, the title of our Parsha, the eponymous word of this verse for our Parsha, it means to see. So why is Moshe saying words and introducing it by saying, hey, see, see these words that I'm telling you. Moreover, Moshe says re'e anochi, see, I have placed before you. The word Anochi seems to be superfluous. The sentence could have read just as easily, Re'ei Nasati. Behold, or see, I have placed before you. Nasati I have placed before you. The word Anochi could have been omitted. Why does the word Anochi appear? A third question that the Archaim asks is, the word Re'ei means to see, or see, it's an instruction, see, but it is a word that in Hebrew and the grammar would be used when speaking to an individual. Re'e means you, the individual, should see. Singular. If Moshe was talking to a lot of people, he would say, Re'u, you, all of you, should see. Lifnechem, in front of you, I've placed in front of you, that is plural. If it was singular, it would say, Lifanech, in front of you. So in the same sentence, Moshe jumps from speaking in a singular fashion to a plural fashion. Why does he change? Isn't he speaking to the whole people? If he's speaking to the whole people, it should say re'u. It should be parshas re'u, not parshas re'e. What's going on? Why is Moshe saying the word re'e in an individual format? And the Orachayim develops an idea and ties it into the words of the verse, and he says something incredibly fundamental. Moshe is trying to convey a message to the people. And of course, he's using contrast, but he's trying to impress upon them the most important message that they need to hear. And of course, not only they need to hear it, we need to hear it as well. Moshe is trying to, in his message, to make the spiritual world, the world of Torah and mitzvos, he's trying to make it appealing. That's the blessing that he's talking about. And the curse of repudiating the mitzvos of the Torah, repudiating God, and instead focusing only on material and physical pleasures, that is something that Moshe is trying to diminish. He's trying to say, this is a blessing, you should adopt it, and this is a curse, and you should avoid it. Moshe is presenting life's conflict in this stark binary fashion. He's telling them there are two worlds. There's the spiritual world, there's the physical world. Which one of those two will you prioritize? Are you going to prioritize the eternal spiritual world or the transient, ephemeral physical world. There are two paths. Which will you favor? There are two life objectives. Are you going to value the spiritual agenda of the soul 
Is that what will motivate you? Is that going to be the overarching objective of your life? Or is the physical agenda of the body, the body, of course, that is a rapidly depreciating entity, soon to be interred in the ground to be munched upon by maggots and worms, is that going to be the focus of your life? Are you going to think long-term and be motivated by the question of what will be the destiny of my soul for eternity? Or will you settle for choosing the short-term interests of your life today as you are currently constructed, a soul inhabiting the body? That's the message that Moshe is trying to impress upon the Jewish people. That's the contrast. Do you want the red pill or the blue pill? Do you want the good or the bad? Do you want the life or the death? Do you want the blessing or the curse? Which will you choose? You can only have one. Now, why is it such a hard message? It seems like it's a slam dunk. How would anyone choose curses? Of course, anyone with their head screwed on straight is going to choose the blessing. Moshe is urging them, choose the blessing. Why is this difficult? So there's an amazing midrash over here that gives an analogy. And it says that there was a crossroads, a fork in the road. And the passerby have two choices to go down this path or down that path. And there's an individual sitting by the crossroads and he's trying to give advice to the people walking down to the fork on the road, as to which path they should take. But these two paths are very different. One path starts off and it's it's really beautiful and it's really pleasant and it's really appealing. And the road or the path looks really smooth and it looks like a delightful, joyous, pleasant ride. But in the end, once you get down this road, it turns into a nightmare. That's one path. The second path, it starts off and it looks like it's full of thorns and thistles and it looks really difficult and scary. But once you get through that initial stretch of path, it turns out to be very beautiful and very delightful and very enjoyable. And all these people are coming to the path and they're like, which way should we go? Of course, we go to the one that looks really nice and appealing and looks really nice and pleasant. I'm not going down the path that has all those thorns. And there's a person there standing at the path crossroads. And he's telling them, the path that looks so appealing, in the end, after two or three steps, you get a little further down the road, it turns into a nightmare. And the one that looks so difficult And so hard to traverse. Well, once you get through the initial hardship, it's all pleasant. Says the Midrash, that is what Moshe is trying to convey to the Jewish people. Moshe is telling them something that is counterintuitive. The path that Moshe tells them is a blessing. To them, it looks daunting and terrifying and painful and arduous and thorny. The path of blessing looks really unappealing to the Jewish people. And the path that Moshe tells him is a curse, well, that looks seductively, irresistibly appealing. But it soon turns into a thorny course, and that's the problem. The path of the curse beckons them. It draws them in. And the path of the blessing is repelling them. It's pushing them away. And the reason why it's so, the reason why the passerby, so to speak, us, in the analogy, we all want to go down the path of the curse. That's the one that looks so appealing to us. Well, that's because there's something called the Yetzirah, evil inclination. The Yetzirah is a very capable and talented force. And its central goal, the reason why it exists, is to persuade man to choose the path of the curse over the path of the blessing. The material, physical world over the spiritual world. The body over the soul. This world over the spiritual world. 
And his tactics are the oldest in the book, and they work like a charm, and they work then, and they work now. And it's the same tricks over and over again throughout all of recorded human history. I was thinking we're, we're in Canada now, and my boys went fishing. And there was one day they went fishing, and the fish kept on biting. And in one day, the boys catch 31 different fish. And I couldn't believe it. You just put a little bait on the hook, and you just drop the line into the water. And after two seconds, some fish comes and bites on it and gets caught up. And you reel them out, and then you do it again and again and again. And I couldn't believe it. I said, it doesn't make any sense to me. These silly fish are falling for the same silly trick over and over again. They don't get it. I can't believe it. Don't you know that when there's this appealing worm dangling in front of you, it's actually hiding a hook that's going to kill you? And then I realized, all of us, we're just like the silly fish. We too are falling for the same silly deceptions time after time. And that's the problem. Moshe is trying to talk to these silly fish. And he's laying out the blessing and the curse. But his prescription, his diagnosis, runs in conflict to their initial perspective. He says the blessing is the mitzvos, but that looks like a path of thorns. He says the curse is the repudiation of mitzvos, but that path seems quite appealing. There's no restrictions. There's no limitations. Freedom! Moshe's message faces stiff headwinds. He is fighting the tide. He is countering the default. He is undertaking an uphill battle. He's fighting the Sahara, who has pole position. He's telling you that what the Yetzirah is selling you is a lie. It looks like a worm. Go grab it. You have an easy lunch. But behind that worm lies a hook that's going to destroy you. The Yetzirah is deceiving you. But us, we're like the fish. We just want to bite. We'll look so appealing. And that is what Moshe is trying to convey to the Jewish people. And how does he do it? How do you fight a nation of fish going after the baited hook? There are two things that Moshe is trying to convey to help the nation make the correct choice. He wants to get them to see the beauty and the joy and the sublimity of the blessing path. And he tries to get them to see the futility and the emptiness of the path of the curse. And how does he do it? Back to the analogy of the two paths. The only way someone can persuade someone to choose the path that seems to be full of thorns over the path that seems so pleasant and appealing, it's only if that person can say definitively, I have gone down both paths. I'm familiar with the end of those paths. Only in that case does the person have the possibility of influencing the people to choose the path that seems to be much more treacherous. Says the Arachayim, to influence people in this manner, you need a particular collection of things. Number one, in order for you to have credibility to make this case, you have to personally know the goodness of the path of blessing. That looks like it's a path of thorns. Number two, you also have to intimately understand what the path of curse is offering. If Moshe was someone who had no connection to this world's appeal and pleasure, well, then his message would fall flat. The people would rebuff it, would reject it. And they would say, oh, you are repudiating this path. You say it's curse. You say that the pursuits of this world's pleasure as an end goal, it's useless, it's futile, it's empty. Well, that's just because you never tasted it. And on the flip side, if Moshe were to hawk the goodness of the spiritually oriented life, but he's actually never tasted it, then it wouldn't be persuasive. 
people would say to him, you're just telling me what you believe, or maybe what you were indoctrinated to believe. And the message that that path is a path of blessing will fall flat. To have credibility in this manner, you have to be credible about the destiny of both paths. And the Arachayim presents a very novel reading of the verse. He says, that's why Moshe says, Re'e, see, Anochi. He adds the word Anochi. Those words can be read as, look at me. Re'e, see, Anochi, me. Look at me. Moshe is saying, you are not going to believe what I'm going to say. Because it runs counter to the worldview that the Eight Sahara has duped you to believe. But look at me. I've been down both these paths. Moshe is someone who had everything this world has to offer. He had greatness. He had fame. He had distinction. Mercedes tell us that he had prodigious physical prowess. He had the power of the monarchy. He was an autocrat. He was the richest Jew in the world. Anything that you could want with respect to pursuits of this world's ends, Moshe already had it. And who better than Moshe knew what the spiritual world has to offer? Moshe was someone who knew both these worlds, who knew both these paths intimately well. And when he assigns them the label, this path is a blessing, this path is a curse, the path that's a blessing It's a real blessing, even though it looks quite treacherous. And the other one that looks quite appealing is truthfully a curse. Coming from Moshe, this message is singularly unimpeachable. Re'e Anochi, look at me. I'm the one who can definitively assign the paths, which one's a blessing and which one's a curse. Moshe is conveying to us this very fundamental message. What path to choose? what life to live, what objectives to prioritize. There is a problem with this message. The path to a blessing, it looks to us to be laden with thorns. The Yetzirah deludes us into seeing the world precisely in the opposite way than it really is. But Moshe is uniquely suited to convey this message to us. He had all the things that the people go down the path of curses want. And he went further down the path of blessing than anyone in history. He can make the definitive call. Re'e Anochi, look at me. I've been down these paths. One is a blessing that will give you eternal life. And one is a curse that will destroy you. This is an idea we've spoken about in the past. Incidentally, we spoke about it. Exactly a year ago, Parshas Re'eh of last year, when we started the streak, we spoke about Unculus, the convert, and how he was able to convert three successive cohorts of hardened Roman legionnaires. He managed to get them to convert and become Jews. And we speculated last year that the reason why Unculus was so persuasive was precisely because of this point. Like Moshe, Unculus was someone who tasted both worlds. He was part of Roman royalty with all the trappings that come with that. He went down the path of curse, yet he became one of the scholars. Like Moshe, Unculus had the credibility to tell the people which one of these worlds is truly better. That's what we spoke about in Parshish of last year. We haven't missed, with the help of the Almighty, Even a single week in between, and we hope and pray that we can get together in good health and great spirits in Pyrrhus Ray of the upcoming year and say the same thing. This is the idea of the Rechaim. You want to sell this most important message, the message of Moshe, the message that's going to change the world, the message to get people to think about what they're living for and to make a choice, which world do you want? Do you want the path of blessing? Do you want the path of the curse? This message is a hard sell. And to make this sell, you have to have the street cred. 
you have to have the credibility. You have to be someone who people could look at you and say, this person has experience, they know what they're talking about. Only then can you stand at the crossroads and tell people which way is the advisable path. Only then can you make an authoritative and incontrovertible declaration, Rei Anochi, look at me, I have experience. Here lies the blessing. And that appealing path, that one that looks so irresistible, it's nothing more than a curse. Now I want to suggest another wrinkle to this idea. Moshe had credibility in assigning the path of blessing. This is a blessing. This is a curse. But what if we bifurcate Moshe's credibility? Let me explain what I'm proposing. Moshe had the credibility to present both the path of blessing of Torah, mitzvot, of a spiritually primary life as appealing, and the path of neglect of Torah and mitzvot as a curse. And he says to them, Re'anohi, look at me, look in my eyes, read my lips. This is a blessing, and this is a curse. And maybe Unculus can do the same to a certain extent. But most of us, we can say the same message. We can utter the identical words of Moshe, but the naysayers and the cynics will not be swayed. But maybe we could break down the credibility of Moshe and divide it up. And maybe if someone indeed went down the path of blessing and knows that it starts off being kind of difficult, it's like thorns at the very beginning, but then things smooth out. And then you find meaning and purpose and the deepest contentment. If you know a bit about the ecstasy of studying with unbridled intensity in a yeshiva, if you know what it's like to achieve an unparalleled intellectual and spiritual high that is unrivaled by anything else, if you know what it's like to think so hard that your head physically hurts, but there's nothing that you would trade that for, if you know what it's like to feel like you actually have some self-control, if you know what it's like to fit some character, if you know the high of being exhausted after a full day of grueling hard work and feeling amazing about it, you too can say, Re'e look at me. I've been down that road. I've walked down this path. And the beginning was rocky. It was hard. It was grueling. It was a fight. But the experience that I had is unmatched by anything else in the world. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. Someone like that can testify that this path is a blessing. And you know what? You don't have the same credibility as Moshe. You can't credibly opine on both paths. You can't say, this is a curse. This is a blessing. But at least you would be able to say unequivocally that the path that is initially daunting is delightfully delicious once you overcome the initial challenges. And on the flip side, someone who's been down the road of hedonism and knows what it has to offer, someone like that can say with credibility and believability, this path is nothing more than a curse. I think this gives us a very valuable call to action. Moshe's short message is the most important message that we all need to hear. You can only choose one world. Which one are you going to prioritize? One's a blessing, while the other, despite being apparently quite irresistible, is nothing more than a curse. This is what we call Messiah's message. It's a really short message that can change the entire world. When you ask the question, what are you living for? Make your choice. Do you want life or death? Do you want blessing or curse? This message is very potent and very powerful. This message has the power to change every individual's life. And I think it's incumbent upon us, all of us, do whatever we can to absorb this message, but also to spread the word. But the same problem facing Moshe when he wanted to convey this message to the people faces us. The Yetzirah are still getting the suckers, us, 
to bite like the fish falling for the same tricks over and over again. So it's not the content of the message that resonates. They say that the medium is the message. Here we discover that the messenger is the message. Re'e anochi, Moshe tells the Jewish people. Look at me. Look at my story. I am living testimony to the blessing of this path and the curse of that one. And most of us, we have to try to hear that message. But if we are fortunate enough to have actually gone down the initially rough path of the blessing and witnessed how it truly is a blessing, we must, like Moshe, say, Re'e Anochi, I can proclaim that this is a blessing. If life has brought you down the other path, you too can be enormously impactful in spreading the message of Moshe, in spreading the message of Messiah. You know, in the yeshiva environment that I was fortunate enough to be in, there is a suspicion on the part of some of the students that the people on the other side of the path, the people took the other path, they're having a really good time. We're sitting here, in this all-male base madrish, in this all-male study hall, and we're studying ancient texts of Talmud, while our co-religionists who don't have Torah, they're having tons of fun, they're having a marvelous time with no restrictions, they're probably awash in girls, eating whatever they want, doing whatever they want, they don't need to study all those very difficult pieces of Talmud, they're having an amazing time partying on the other path. I remember a yeshiva student telling me that he cannot imagine why someone would abandon that world to join the yeshiva to spend 10 hours a day studying Torah. It didn't make any sense to him. And the reason why it didn't make any sense to him is because he never tasted that world. He has no idea that that's really a curse. To him, all he sees is the beginning. and the beginning, it looks really appealing. He hasn't been down that road to know what it's truly about. I remember another young yeshiva student who I was talking to. He was trying to persuade me that it's really good for him to dip his toe in that other world. I want to get a taste of it. This is what he told me. Because you see, the people that abandon Torah for a little bit, they have a little lapse in their commitment and observance. And then they come back. They come back much stronger. That's what he told me. And therefore, ergo, it made sense for me to go taste that world. Let me try it for myself just so I know what to avoid. This, again, is someone speaking who hasn't gone down that path. And it looks so pleasant and appealing and so irresistible and he wants to go taste it. But if you have been down that path, and you know, not because someone told you about it, you know because of yourself. You too can say, Re'e Anochi, look at me. You can proclaim that that fantasy of the yeshiva student is totally fake. It's not that good. Yeah, maybe there's a little fun at the beginning, but there's a lot of loneliness. It ain't all that you think it is. And you know what? Even the ones who succeed in getting all those hedonistic pleasures, they feel empty afterwards. They feel devoid of meaning and purpose. Moshe was the one who could say the complete Re'e Anochi. I know both paths and I can make a definitive statement. This is a blessing and this is a curse. I think for most of us, we're not quite ready to make our declaration. And then there are those who can give over half the message. Someone who has truly lived the path of the blessing can say, Re'e Anochi, look at me. I can testify that this is a blessing. And someone who's been down the other road can say, Re'e Anochi, look at me. That road is a curse. It takes a rare person who can do both. Moshe was able to do it. Even in our world, there's still some people who can definitely do the full ray. I know he look at me. I know both paths. For example, you have someone like Rabbi Uri Zohar who was Israel's greatest celebrity. He was a movie star. He was a comedian. He was a late-night television show host. He was on top of the world in one path. 
And he abandoned it all and became a rabbi and eventually a huge Torah scholar. And he is deeply embedded now in the path of blessing. He can definitely testify. I know both of those worlds better than most will know any one of them. And I can testify this is a blessing and this is a curse. I imagine that Messiah himself will also be able to say the full Re'anochi, look at me. It seems to me more likely that Messiah will not be a monastic, ascetic person who lives in poverty, who never tasted or never had access to the other world. I think he will be, this is my speculation, but I think he will be someone who can personally embody this choice and say Re'anochi and convince the whole world That one path is a blessing and one path is a curse. May we all be so fortunate to see this world, to see the whole world be woken up to the message of Moshe, that a life prioritizing the spiritual agenda, prioritizing the spiritual world, prioritizing the soul, that's a blessing. And the one that repudiates it is a curse. May it come speedily in our days. Okay, let's get to this week's A&Q. And this week's edition of the A&Q focuses on every fundraiser's favorite teaching in the Talmud. But wait a minute, Wolby, wait a minute. What does it mean that there is a teaching in the Talmud that every fundraiser loves? Let's have a look. The Talmud, the book of Tainus, page 9a, Quotes a verse in our Parsha, 1422 of the book of Devarim, Parsha's Rei, and it says like this, Aser ta Aser. You should surely tithe, says the Talmud. What does it mean, Aser ta Aser? Aser means for the word Eser, which means 10 or 10%. You should tithe, but then it says it again, ta Aser. Says the Talmud, Aser, you should tithe. Bishvil shetit asher, in order that you become rich. And the Talmud gives us a story where the great Rabbi Yochanan, he met his nephew. And they started talking. And Rabbi Yochanan said to the young boy, he said to him, well, what do you study in school today? What verse are you up to? And he quoted this verse, Aser ta Aser. And then he asks his uncle, the great rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan, well, what does this verse mean? And Rabbi Yochanan tells him, this verse means, Aser bishvil shatit asher. You should tithe in order that you should become wealthy. And the young boy asked the great rabbi, well, how do you know that? What evidence do you have that that's the interpretation of the verse? So, Rabbi Yochanan tells him, well, why don't you go and try it? Give 10% of the money to charity, tithe, and see if you become rich. But the boy said to him, are you allowed to test God? Don't we learn earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, that you're not allowed to test the Almighty? So how could you tell me that the reason why you know that if you tithe, if you give 10% of the money to charity, you're going to become rich is because you tried it and you tested it. You're not allowed to test God. So Rabbi Yochanan responded to him. He says, yes, you're right. Normally, you're not allowed to test God. However, the verse in Malachi, so elsewhere in scripture, it says, please test me in this area. In this year, this one area where the Almighty promises, if you tithe, if you give 10% of the money to charity, You'll become rich. This is the one exception to the rule that you can't test God. Normally you can't test God, but here you can. Thus, the Talmud tells us, number one, if you tithe, you'll become rich. Number two, this is the one area that you're allowed to test God. So why is this the fundraiser's favorite Talmud? Because, first of all, you could say, hey, I'm not asking you for a donation for my benefit. It's for your benefit. You'll become rich. And you know what? Try it. Talmud says you could try it. Test God. See how it goes. But here's the question. The Talmud tells us there's only one instance where you're allowed to test God. With all the mitzvos, 
you do all the mitzvos, and some of the mitzvos were told that you'll get reward, but you're not allowed to test God. You can't say, let me do it, and let's see where the reward is. There's only one exception. Of all the mitzvos, this is the only one that's singled out the one mitzvah where you're allowed to test God. And the question is, why? Why specifically with respect to tithing, with respect to charity, why here are you allowed to test God, whereas by every other mitzvah, you are not allowed to test God? Now, as I mentioned, I'm in Canada now, spending some time with the family, and I asked this question to my brilliant brother-in-law, Shmuley Botnik, and he told me an amazing answer, a mind-blowing answer. And I want to tell you, it demands a lot of restraint. Herculean restraint for me to wait until next week to share this answer with you. So you have to come back next week. But until then, you are mobilized, oh Parsha podcast family members. Show me what you can do. Explain to me why, with respect to tithing, it's the one place you're allowed to test God. The Talmud says it clearly. The book of Titus, page 9a. Why is this mitzvah, and this mitzvah alone, the one area that you can test God? Send me an email if you have an answer. Rabbi Wolby at gmail.com. Okay, last week we asked the following question. Moshe did a half mitzvah, half of the job, twice. In one instance, he brought Joseph's bones out of Egypt, but he failed to bury them. He was buried later on by the Jewish people in the city of Shechem. In a second instance, Moshe designated three cities of refuge, but not the final three of six. And Moshe is apparently treated very differently for these two half mitzvahs. For the bones of Joseph, Moshe is the canonical example of when you don't finish a mitzvah, and then it's not attributed to you. However, with regards to the cities of refuge, Moshe is lavishly praised, even though he did only half of the job. Look how much Moshe loves mitzvos. So, there are a few answers here I want to share with you all today. First of all, these two half mitzvos are dissimilar. When Moshe took the bones of Joseph, out of Egypt, Moshe thought he was under the impression that he indeed would be able to consummate the mitzvah. He intended on finishing it. Whereas Moshe's designation of the three cities of refuge on the east side of the Jordan, that was done after he knew that he was not going to enter the land. And therefore, with respect to Joseph's bones, Moshe failed to finish what he intended to complete. Whereas with the designation of the three cities of refuge, Moshe went as far as he thought he could go. That's idea number one. Another thought that I had, and this is speculation, related to some of the stuff we talked about in the past, Moshe wanted to enter the land. And Moshe prayed 550 times to be able to go into the land to annul the decree that God said, you're not going to enter the land. Maybe Moshe should have prayed to enter the land in order to bury Joseph's bones. And who knows, maybe that prayer would have been efficacious. So maybe the criticism on Moshe with respect to the bones of Joseph was that he did not pray to be able to enter the land to be able to complete the mitzvah. Maybe if Moshe told the God, hey, I started the mitzvah, let me enter the land to be able to complete it, maybe that argument would have been persuasive. And finally, This last answer is what I call logic with a tad of lambdas. Lambdas is some of the analytical thinking we're trained to do in the yeshiva. Perhaps these two mitzvos are different kinds of mitzvos. Meaning maybe the burial of Joseph, that's one singular mitzvah. Yes, it takes a while. You got to find the bones of Joseph. You got to transport them. You have to dig the hole, bury Joseph in Shechem. But it's one long mitzvah that took more than 40 years to accomplish. It's one single mitzvah. Whereas perhaps the other mitzvah, the designation of the six cities of refuge, it's not one big mitzvah that is fulfilled with the six different designations. 
Rather, it's six distinct mitzvahs. Each sanctuary city is a standalone station, and therefore it's a standalone mitzvah to designate that particular city. Ergo, perhaps we can say that Moshe finished the mitzvah of designating city one, two, and three. He finished those three standalone mitzvahs, and therefore, with regards to that, he is lavishly praised because he did as much as he could have done. Do you like those answers? Are they good answers? If you like it, send me an email. If you don't like it, also send me an email. I look forward to hearing from you. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Parsha Podcast. As always, my email address is rabbojima.com. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. A fantastic and splendid and wonderful and delightful and enjoyable on every level Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with help the mighty, we'll talk again next week.